before I got here. I had done uh, some programming when I was a kid. I learned basic, I learned assembly. And I, even when I first moved to New York as an adult, I took an evening course in C programming. And I thought, programming, I, maybe I'd like that. You know, I'll take a course in that. And I didn't like it at all. I was like, I did with media director. And it, I think the very first week assignment I did, I got these two images of magnets that I downloaded and tried to make them appear as if they were magnets being attracted to each other, which is funny to just realize that now, because I think the very last thing I was just doing, like 10 years later sitting in my office, was writing an explanation of like attraction forces or something. So I've just been doing the same thing, I realize, now for 12 years. But our 10 discovered it. The first, once I started, taking a course where it, was, where it was saying like, hey, you're gonna learn to program, and while you're learning to program, why don't you draw some stuff on the screen? That's really where it, it kind of clicked that this was kind of something you, I could just sit and tweak the numbers forever and ever and ever to just watch slightly different things happen. Um. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's a little bit intangible in a way. I mean, I think, you know, people say, oh, I'm a visual thinker or I'm a designer, I'm an artist, I do visual medium, so it makes sense for me to learn code that way. That's not really, I think, for me, what happened. I don't know exactly what happened because I don't think of myself as a visual designer. I don't think of myself as particularly visually talented. I think most of the things that I, if you asked me to draw or design something, it would come out rather ugly. But I do think that the um, the the sort of the the realization there's a certain realization that happens uh, when you start to write your own software and you start to manipulate pixels where you you know this this mysterious computer that you buy and you unpack and you put it on your desk and it's loaded with all the software and you use it to use all this stuff when the moment that you realize that it's not magic it's not you, you could just write all that software yourself. You can manipulate the pixels, you can draw, you don't need Photoshop. Photoshop is a wonderful piece of software for many reasons. But I think for me that the visual nature of programming and drawing graphics, um, it just opened up a world of possibilities that maybe didn't exist. Or that, that, uh, there's an interesting uh, Chuck Close quote, I think, which is that he considers computers to be a labor-saving device, and, and that being a negative thing. I, I think on, on the one hand, this is something that computers offer. You can iterate and try certain ideas out very, very quickly that you couldn't do. On, on the other hand, there is a certain uh, quality to making something by hand, the slowness of that, the, the, the sort of methodology of the physicality of drawing um, that I think is also really special. So I, I don't know that they necessarily, that I don't know that there's one thing, there's the things that a computer can do and the things that a person can't do. For me, however, experiment. right, you can experiment. There's, there's an element of surprise that's really enjoyable. I mean, for me, these days, I spend more of my time teaching than, than creating my own sort of thing. So to me, the excitement is actually, uh, um, the, the realization is helping or is, is teaching and allowing people to realize that this thing called computer programming is not, is a thing that they can do and that they can enjoy doing, and that they can do in a free, experimental, goofy kind of way without this sort of like pressure and exact science, uh, the sort of need for exactness, yeah. And, this, and, and realizing that these algorithms, these ideas, these concepts could be translated and simulated into code um, to create this visual effect that is oddly compelling. I think something about mirroring the world that we live in on the screen has this uh, sort of mystical, uh, quality to it. Um, um, okay, we live in this world. There are things like uh, gravity. There are things like plants and trees. There's waves. There's all sorts of stuff. Anything that we see in the world around us, what would it mean to try to simulate that in code? Whether that means here's the actual mathematical formula and translate that into code that we can run in processing, or you know, here's this tricky, goofy OpenGL like blending effect that kind of looks like clouds, even though it has nothing to do with the science of clouds. So the book is trying to um, not, uh, it's not a science book, it's not an art book, it's, it's really just about um, different techniques and strategies uh, for exploring ways of simulating the natural or the world that we live in. Beautiful. Uh, I'm thinking about the book, but I do like to think of it as telling a story. So there is this story which is, you know, what's the beginning of the story? 
x equals x plus 1. Well, you have this thing you're drawing at the location x, and you add 1 to it, it moves over here. You add 1 to it, it moves over here, and that's programming animation, that's programming motion, the basic fundamentals. So you start there, and then, oh, you add y. Well, now I have x and y, I can make that into a vector. Well, that vector is its velocity. Oh, that's no longer constant. You could have an acceleration, which the velocity changes, and now, uh, oh, but force equals mass times acceleration. OK, well, if I have acceleration and there's this relationship between force and acceleration, then I can start to simulate forces. So there is this like building up of concepts. Start with the very, very basic elements of graphics and drawing and animation, layer on this, layer on that. And then um, just that, and what, what, it, what's, what's sort of exciting about this is that basic motion, that just basic idea of motion, it's there in every single example, basically, throughout the entire book. It's just, well, here's a fancier way to calculate the acceleration. Now let's Let's put a lot of those things together. Now, what if they interact with each other? What if we try to evolve them? What if we try to uh, recursively like structure them on top of each other? So the, it's but that but but thinking of that as a story that everything connects and that you're sort of learning and building piece by piece is kind of uh, whether that's in reality actually in the book or just sort of a nice idea that I hopefully achieve. But that's that's how I think about it. And what you're you know re thinking about the game Spore and the Sims and all these games that are sort of you know, where these, these autonomous agents are living in a world that, and they operate with these simple rules and, you know, uh, just thinking about StarCraft and there, there's a lot of that type of elements. And interestingly enough, I, 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 w I wasn't really thinking about games in making these examples or making the book, but it is really my hope that some of these concepts could help people um, in, in, uh, in game programming for sure. That that you know the, the total fantasy is, and I, I don't think this is necessarily realistic at the, this present moment of the world that we live in. But that you could read the book and you learn these basic building blocks and you understand about rules and you program this and you program that. And as you're iterating and building and building and building, ultimately you would have just essentially programmed the entire universe. And to me, I, I look is it what, on what level if you can understand these simple tiny building blocks and everything is just a nested system of these, you know. You know, the, the body is a system of cells, the city is a system of bodies, the world is a system of cities. You can go on and on and on, powers of 10, et cetera. So that, to me, is a very sort of exciting thing, this idea of you know, how far could we get <laughs> in recreating our world through uh, an algorithm. Um, on some level, in some theoretical, you know, it, I, I believe it's possible in the same way that I believe uh, but a million monkeys sitting at a million typewriters will eventually reproduce all, all of the works that you know, of Shakespeare and any other book ever written ever. I mean, it sort of seems possible in this in this sort of beautiful concept of infinity. But whether we uh, uh, could build something that that has that sort of capacity for infinity, I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah, what I thought about it is the reality will only get you so far. Often, you have to use tricks to make things seem more real, and these tricks are absolutely not based in reality. So, but you know, as things move about around each other on the screen, if they get way too close, the force gets way too big. If they get way too far, the force gets way too small. So you know, you fudge the numbers and you cap the, the minimum distance and you cap the maximum distance, and and so it looks sort of more realistic. But you know, the real world, you're not capping things and constraining things and adding a little extra fudge variable, a little smoothing and things. So there is this sort of um, tension between. Um, and, and I see this with students all the time, this desire for purity in this weird sort of way, like I want to use the real formula, but versus like, well, I just want to make this project that has this feeling to it. And often the feeling of reality is based in a particular set of goofy, strange, almost accidental code that somebody might write without even uh, doing it on purpose, which I think is really interesting. Is that uh, when you first learn to program, and let's say you're first learning in processing, and you, uh, you're, you open up processing and you learn, here, I can draw a rectangle, and I I can draw a circle, and I can draw a line, and I can I give them x, y locations, and I give them colors. OK, well, I want to do something more with that, but I've just started to learn. You know, What's the next logical step? Well, I'll make a lot of them, and I'll just make them all random, all random positions, all random colors. It's an e because it's useful. At the same time, uh, randomness can be not very thoughtful, and it can be a crutch. And it can be so easy to just, well, I made this project. And uh, let me just make it all, I don't really know what, I'm, uh, what to do here. I'll just make all that random. So I think one of the, you're looking at uh, some of the later examples where we're looking at modeling evolution, and we need to pick 
uh, uh, which elements in a system should be picked as parents of the next generation, and we're going to, and and that's done with probability. You have to, we, uh, the, it's a nice strategy to use random numbers as a means for uh, executing those probabilities. Only on a keyboard. So genetic algorithms are a tool to say the search space for some problem, the solution space is so big, instead of checking every possible solution, what we can do is create a population of you know, candidate solutions. Let's make 100 possible solutions. OK, most of these are terrible solutions. Some of them are medium solutions. Some of them are very good, but not the right solution, but very close. So what if we took some of the very good ones and we kind of like mixed them up and then made some new solutions? And let's take the best of those and mix them up so we can get to the answer very, very, very quickly. So let's find something in between. Is there a simulation, an ecosystem-like simulation where you have things moving around and they have health and they might, uh, based on their health, might dwindle or it might go up and the longer they're there, the more likely they might be to find another element of that system and reproduce. So that, that that um, there's a famous uh, work by uh, Carl Sims called uh, Galapagos, and he used a genetic algorithm to, to evolve what you might think of as what, what the, the idea, at least the spirit behind this project, was to evolve the most beautiful image. So what if you what if we just right behind me you put up ten images and you had an infinite number of people coming to look at these images, and you had sensors to determine which ones which images they're looking at and for how long, and the ones that they were looking at for longer their fitness would go up and the the whatever is encoded into those images would make its way to the next generation. The theory there is that maybe over time you would evolve the most beautiful image. The, oh, but really, what are you evolving? The, the, an image that people are most likely to stand in front of the longest. So what subjective nature that has is an open question. So I think a lot of projects have used genetic algorithms in this vein as a kind of design tool. Well, instead, then you think. I mean, one of the things about evolution in the, in the natural world is it happens over extremely long periods of time with massive amounts of things in the population. And if you have to hand, have users hand rating things, you know, how many things could you look at and rate over a certain period of time? So there are some big challenges there. Um, and processing. It's a really advanced uh, environment to build stuff in now. And there's a lot, but at the same time, it still retains this you launch it, it opens, here's your window, you can just type line 100, 100, 200, 200, hit run, and there's your line on the screen. So there's very other, there's very few other. Uh, programming environments slash languages where it's just so easy to get started. Now, there's limitations without open source. It's the vibrant community of dedicated people who are just so willing to share and help each other. It's, 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 it's so obvious by reading through the forums of the processing forums and by uh, seeing people at conferences or meetups and how they share and teach each other. And the, the, just that sort of willingness and desire to sort of share and learn that comes with the community of people that, that, that use these open source uh, tools. So um, that it says like, you know, I don't have some contract that says, make lots of open source examples and give them away for free and you'll be paid for that. But essentially, I'm really lucky to work in an environment where that's valued. And that is, it's, it's, I'm very interested in solving a problem and learning about how to solve a problem, but once you've gotten to a point where you either need help or that you finish solving it, it's much more interesting to then engage with the wider community. So I would have that, that writing code is, is somewhat meditative for me. I, you know, I, I, um, I have a uh, four-year-old son now at home, and the other day he has these like little toy uh, superheroes, and he li and and uh, in his room they were all lined up in a line. Like all, like the nine of them in a line, and my, my wife said to me, "Did you do that or did he do that?" And he had done it. And I, but the reason why she asked is that's the kind of thing that I find myself doing. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I hopefully I'm not in in a, in a situation where I'm like stuck in a room flicking a light switch and never to come out. But this sort of uh, this desire for order or to to accumulate thoughts in order to structure and organize thoughts in order, I find to be sort of soothing and meditative. And I, for me, that's what is very beautiful about code. So you know, I, I joke about it often in class, but I, I feel when I look at the screen and the, the indentation of the code is like not aligned properly, I feel like an uncomfortable feeling. I hope that no, most people don't have that. They, people should make messy code and enjoy themselves. But I, that sort of what is, when you make something, is it the code? Is it the output? I think different artists have a point of view on that, and some have a very specific point of view. And if you're archiving it, are you archiving the output? Are you archiving the code? Are you archiving the hardware that it runs on? These are all questions that I think 
I would, don't want to answer because they're being answered by lots of people today in their work. So pixels, where you, you know, this this mysterious computer that you buy and you unpack and you put it on your desk and it's loaded with all the software and you use it to use all this stuff. When the moment that you realize that it's not magic, it's not. You, you could just write all that software yourself. You can manipulate the pixels, you can draw, you don't need Photoshop. Photoshop is a wonderful piece of software for many reasons. But I think for me that the visual nature of programming and drawing graphics, um, it just opened up a world of possibilities that maybe didn't exist. Or that, that it didn't, um, what a computer offers me is a chance to be creative in a, in, a, in a way that I don't think that I normally am in everyday life. I'm much too afraid well, you know, uh, I, I also, t at the same time that I took this intro to programming uh, class, I took a physical computing class to learn about building things and electronics and circuits. And, you know, it just didn't work for me. I was, you know, burning my fingers or setting things on fire and <laughs> falling apart. The, the, the sort of, the, the, the way that you think about software, the logical steps, the way that you think about pixels, um, it just it fits with a, a way that I like to think, and to me that offered a chance to be creative where I, I wouldn't necessarily have done without them. Does the computer like that they can do in a free, experimental, goofy kind of way without this sort of like pressure and exact science uh, the sort of need for exactness? Yeah. So uh, it's oddly compelling. I think something about mirroring the world that we live in on the screen has this uh, sort of mystical uh, quality to it. Um, live in this world, there are things like uh, gravity, there are things like plants and trees, there's waves, there's all sorts of stuff. Anything that we see in the world around us, what would it mean to try to simulate that in code? Whether that means here's the actual mathematical formula and translate that into code that we can run in processing, or you know, here's this tricky, goofy OpenGL like blending effect that kind of looks like clouds, even though it has nothing to do with I, I, I find games that have this middle ground between luck and skill to be absolutely fascinating. So roulette doesn't really interest me. I mean, it interests me sort of in some ways in thinking about it, but a game that's purely based on chance is so much less interesting to me than a game that has a lot of chance and a little bit of skill because the way really fast, it's, the same, it's very similar to the stock market. You know, Somebody could start a hedge fund and make bazillions of dollars and we could all believe that person must be some uber genius or they could have just accidentally arrived at a certain moment in time with some arbitrary strategy that happened to do well. But if you, over the long term, if that person tried their hand managing a head fund millions of times over hundreds of years, they might come out a net loser. <laughs> a traditional, so a traditional computer science genetic algorithm uh, was developed to solve search problems. Going back to the monkeys, so the, the standard example, which is in, uh, used in a lot of books and explanations about genetic algorithms, if you think about a monkey typing at a typewriter, would that monkey randomly type Let's say, let's just say just the line to be or not to be. So that line has um, uh, T O space B T. I should not, you can just cut this out. <laughs> T. But anyway, it has, let's say there's a, a line of text to be or not to be uh, needs to get 15 characters right. Let's say there's a, a keyboard with just 26 uh, characters plus a space bar. It's 27 possibilities. So you have a one. That monkey has a one in 27 chance of pressing the letter T. A 1 in 27 to, times a 1 in 27 chance of pressing T-O. And exponentially, the chances of that monkey accidentally typing to be or not to be are unbelievably, it's unbelievably out of control, unlikely. Way beyond what you would ever really imagine. And so um, the amount of possibilities are so vast. You could never brute for force search. You would need hundreds of times as much time as the entire estimated length of the universe just to search through all the possible phrases uh, uh, that you could type randomly on a keyboard. So genetic algorithms are a tool to say the search space for some problem, the solution space is so big, instead of checking every possible solution, what we can do is create a population of you know, candidate solutions. Let's make 100 possible solutions, OK? Most of these are terrible solutions. Some of them are medium solutions. Some of them are very good, but not the right solution, but very close. So what if we took some of the very good ones and we kind of like mix them up and then made some new solutions? And let's take the best of those and mix them up so we can get to the answer very, very, very quickly. So what's weird about this, though, is that, OK, um, it involves a candidate solution 
calculating a fitness for that candidate solution, having the fitness correspond to the probability that that solution would be picked to pass its genetic information down to the next generation. But if you think about the world that we live in, let's say we're going to evolve some fruit flies. Maybe fruit, uh, we don't, it, it doesn't happen that there's just, a, OK, here's a room full of 100 fruit flies. Let's all, let them all live for five minutes. Then let's get some tape and marker and put scores on all of them. Then pick the ones we like, have them make some babies, and kill them all off. There's this, uh, the world is much more fluid. There's no fitness function. There's just the longer you live, the more likely you might be to reproduce. So this tension between this kind of like natural process and this highly formalized, computerized process is really interesting. And what I like to do with genetic algorithms is um, demonstrate, talk about sort of the reality, the biologic, biological evolution, look at the sort of strict formal computer science genetic algorithms, and see if we can find something in between. Is there a simulation, an ecosystem-like simulation, where you have things moving around and they have health, and they might, uh, based on their health, might dwindle or it might go up, and the longer they're there, the more likely they might be to find another element of that system and reproduce. So that that's